forget this microphone, y'all. How are y'all doing, everybody? Let me look at you. Beautiful church family. I love you guys. Y'all go ahead and turn into your Bibles if you want to, to Revelation 22, 1 through 2. That's where we're going to start this evening. But for those of you, many of you know, but many of you don't know, um, I grew up in this church, 20 years in Victory Life Church in Sherman specifically. And this last year, over a year ago, the Lord spoke, had been speaking and speaking for years to our family, to my husband and I, Tuck, to go to Colorado. And so um, about a little over a year ago, we were asked to go to Colorado. And so we have spent the last year in Woodland Park, Victory Life Church in Woodland Park, Colorado. And we just got back in May. And it is good to be home, y'all. It's so sweet to be home. Um, and with that, you know, when we went to Colorado, we went open-handed. We knew the Lord had been speaking to us for a long time that we were going to spend some time in Colorado, but we didn't know how long that was going to be or what that was going to look like. So you go open-handed. He doesn't always give you all the terms and conditions. Is that right? <laughs> Sometimes you just go in faith. And so we had a tremendously wonderful year in Colorado. I could not even begin to unpack just what this year has meant to our family and what the experience was to us. We're still unpacking. We still don't even know all that the Lord accomplished and what we experienced and the people we connected to. You know, our Woodland Park location is thriving and growing. Isn't it awesome to remember? We have family all over the map. We have family all over the world. Do you know people are watching us in Pakistan and Scotland, all over the world? We have family everywhere that they say Victory Life Church is their home. So, um, so it was so sweet to be with our Woodland Park family this last year. And it is so sweet and good to be home, y'all. So thank you for welcoming us home. Thank you for making room for us so that we can get plugged back in. It's so good to be here and, I'm, and we're excited. We're tired, and we're so excited, y'all. We're getting resettled. Um, tonight, we're going to just go on a journey through Scripture, and I'm so excited, y'all. I love the subject we're going to be looking at tonight, and I just this is one I, I gravitate toward over and over and over, and there's always more to unpack. But um, what I want you to take away, if nothing else, because we're going to go to school tonight. We're going to cover a lot of Scripture and a lot of thoughts, but... One thing, if you take nothing else away from tonight's message, my heart is that you feel nourished in this truth that God, Abba God, our Father, He loves you so deeply, and He has gone through extensive lengths in order to dwell with you, to live daily with you for eternity. He is crazy about you. And if you don't take anything else from tonight, I want you to chew on that this week, that Abba loves you. Simply being with you is his heart's motivation and his desire. It is his heart's motive and his desire to be with you. If you were the only human being on the planet, he would have still done everything that he had to do in order to dwell and walk daily with you. Amen? Amen. So Revelation 22, let's read this, verse 1 through 2. It says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. It's beautiful, right? This evening and next week, we are going to be looking at the topic of the garden. That is the title of tonight's message. It's the garden. And what I want us to see in looking at Revelation 22, we are in the end of the book. We're in the final chapter of the final book of the whole story of the Bible. And Holy Spirit, as the masterful author that he is, like with any good book, he wants us to begin to draw certain conclusions about what the purpose of the whole book was when we arrive at the end. 
You know, have you ever just read a really good book and you get to the end of it and it's just so, it's this aha moment. You're just like, oh my gosh, you just see the whole story pulled together and you're crying and you're moved and this is amazing and you wish you could just read it all over again so you could experience that again. So here in Revelation, he's tying the entire book together. And this author, Holy Spirit, who has inspired all of the books of the Bible, he wants us to draw certain conclusions about what we've just read. So imagine you're sitting down and you're reading the book cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. And then you come to Revelation 22 and he's describing a garden city. He's describing the bride as this garden temple. Now, what it's supposed to evoke for us is, I've seen this before. Where have I seen this before? So what good authors do a lot of times when you sit down and you start a a book, a good author will in the opening chapter begin to foreshadow where you're going to end up. A good author is going to show you in the opening where you are going. And so this author, Holy Spirit, has shown us in the beginning in Genesis where we are going to end up. So we see in Genesis, we are introduced to a garden, and that is where we end up, back in this garden, only it's different now. It's new. And what our author, Holy Spirit, wants us to begin to conclude is God the Father's heart has never changed. He always intended to live with his people in a garden. This is Abba's heart from cover to cover. And so as we look at this theme and unpack this tonight and next week, I don't want this to just be, ooh, an interesting study of scripture. I want us to realize we are peering in to the heart of Abba, what he desires most. He desires to dwell with his people in his garden. Now, a good author, if you study literary critique, A good author is not just going to foreshadow in the opening of the book. A good author is going to leave a trail throughout the whole book. You're going to see themes reemerging over and over. He's going to be telling you secretly the same story over and over so that when you get to the conclusion, it's this revelatory aha moment. And I love, it's called revelation. All of the scripture was to get us to this revelation that God has never changed his mind, his heart and pursuit. The desire of his heart is to dwell with his people in his garden. Amen? Amen. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to trace this theme. It's like a strand on a tapestry that takes us from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Tonight, we're going to look specifically at the Old Testament and how the Lord is weaving this narrative so he can bring us all the way to Revelation 22, where we see the new Jerusalem a new creation, and it's described, the bride of Christ is described, like what we just read, as this garden. But we're going to start with the garden. So are y'all good? Y'all buckle up? Y'all ready? Something I want to point out to you, just in general, because we're not going to be able to hit everything, obviously. But um, think about land, uh, trees, rivers, fruit. Land, trees, rivers, fruit. Garden imagery. Land, trees, rivers, fruit. From the opening of your Bible to the close, you see this imagery coming up over and over again. In the Old Testament, we see it as type and shadows. Land, trees, rivers, fruit. In the New Testament, it says plainly what the land, trees, river, fruit are alluding to. So what we're going to do with our Old Testament is break it down into its parts. You know, your, your Old Testament's broken into parts. And the first part is the Pentateuch. It's the first five books of the Bible or the law. The Pentateuch or the law, those first five books. So I want us to start there of looking at the garden, but we need to go to Genesis. We need to go to the Genesis story when we're in the Garden of Eden. So let's start in the Garden of Eden and see what we can see. 
the first thing after the Lord creates this incredible garden, he creates this beautiful, perfect paradise that he places man and woman on the inside of. And then he gives them this mandate. And that's what I want us to look at first. But to notice, I love this, y'all. There's so much here. I don't think I can get it all out of my heart. But he creates this beautiful world, this beautiful world that he breathes into being. He speaks into being. And he calls it good. And I love this because that description is so power packed. It's so powerful that he calls everything he created good because a main descriptor of the Lord's nature is that Abba is good. He's the good one. If anything's good, it's Abba. But then he creates something that he looks at and he calls it good. He calls you and I good. He calls this created world good. What he's saying in that is so manifold. There's so much in that statement. It, he's saying, I see myself in this. I see myself. I see my reflection in this creation that I've made in mankind and in the world that I've placed it in. So now you see Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 have been placed in this beautiful garden that the Lord calls good, this, this world that looks like him. It's of his essence. It's like him. And in Genesis 1.28, he gives this mandate to Adam and Eve. It says he blesses them. And then God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. I'll just stop there. To be fruitful, multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion have dominion over all of the creation. So a couple of things I want to point out here. It's the first piece that says, be fruitful. I want you to put that in your pocket. Remember we said land, trees, rivers, fruit, fruit being a major theme throughout all of the story. So he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So when he says this to be fruitful, he's speaking obviously natural reproduce. You're going to make children in your likeness and fill the earth with your family. But as with everything in scripture and everything in existence, you have natural things and a supernatural undercurrent. There's a spiritual undercurrent. So they're not just going to repro reproduce after the flesh and create children. They're going to be reproducing after the spirit. There's something that they are going to be yielding that is supernatural. The mandate itself is supernatural. That God's put two humans in a garden, and that garden now is supposed to fill all the earth. That's a supernatural mandate. The only way that they're going to be able to do this is through communion with the Holy Spirit. That's a tall order. They are going to cultivate a garden that's going to spread across the entire planet and remain a perpetual garden for generation after generation. That's a tall order. It's a supernatural calling. So this thing he's called them to do is going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want us to keep this in mind, the fruitfulness and then the filling the earth, that this garden was always intended to fill the earth. Okay. Now we're going to look at this just for funsies just because it's fun. <laughs> this next part, because there's so many details in the Genesis story, just Genesis 1 through 3. If you were going to look at all of the garden imagery, what's happening in this place, we could break down every part of it. But something I want to point out just for fun, it reveals to us the presence of the Holy Spirit in his relationship with man. And that's through these four rivers. There are four rivers that are flowing through the Garden of Eden. Four rivers. So guys, I'm so sorry. I did not put the reference for where you could specifically read the rivers. Just read Genesis 1 through 3. It's in there. These four rivers are described. So the first one, I was fascinated. As I'm studying this, I was fascinated by the names of these four rivers. And I want you to allow them to speak prophetically of the person of Holy Spirit and our relationship with him. So the first river is called the Pashan. I don't know how to say it. Pashan. That's the best I got. Pashan means great outpouring. Great outpouring. Full flowing, fully diffused to spread out. Pashan means real existence. Perfect substantiality. Being and carried to its highest degree. This is a beautiful description of the meaning of this Hebrew name, Pashan 
means great outpouring. This I saw reflected in the prophetic word in Joel 2.28. It says, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Who's in the prophecy stage of life? Just kidding. Don't answer that. If you're paying attention, you got me. <laughs> we, we can all prophesy. We're all young. We're all young. Guys, these people were like 400 years old. We're youngsters. Joel 2.28, he says, shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit. Pashan, great outpouring. This is a great outpouring. The second river that we see in Genesis is the Gihon, which means bursting forth or gushing. Bursting forth or gushing. John 7, 38 is kind of a paraphrase of this concept. It says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, he's paraphrasing a concept in the Old Testament. As scripture has said, out of his heart will flow. Some translations say will burst forth rivers of living water. So do you see how these rivers are prophesying a reality to us that they're not even fully realizing? It's an invitation that we, this side of the cross, we get to step into. We get to know this river, the person of the Holy Spirit. The next one, the third one, is the Tigris or, or Hittakel. The Tigris. It means swift propagator. I love this one. Swift prof- propagator. So he's swift. He's moving. And to propagate means to essentially multiply, to reproduce itself. He's swiftly reproducing himself. I saw this reflected in Acts 2, 1 through 2, in the upper room. When the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh, it describes it like this. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, there were all together. They were all together in one place, and suddenly, or swiftly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing, a swift wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. It goes on to describe that on each person was seen cloven tongues of fire. See, he came in rushing. He came in swiftly, and then he propagated. He reproduced himself in every person in that room. He poured his spirit out on that gathering, but it was a pouring out for the church for all time. We have got to partake of what was accomplished in that upper room because Joel was fulfilled. He poured his spirit out on all flesh, and he has swiftly propagated, he has reproduced himself by giving each one of us the full measure of the Spirit, the moment we say yes to Jesus. Amen? Our swift propagator. Number four, the fourth river in Genesis that's described is the Euphrates, or the Parath, the Euphrates. It it means great river, but in the, the word Parath, para means to be fruitful. So this great river is a fruitful river. It also means good. It's a good river. It's a good and a fruitful river. And I saw this reflected in the promise of Galatians 5, 22 through 23. He says, the fruit of the Spirit. Where does the fruit come? It comes from the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So wherever this river goes, these fruits are going to be produced. Amen? The fruit's going to be produced. So I love how in the details, what I want you to see, there's so many, guys. In the details of your scripture, he is revealing layers to us of meaning. And what I love about tracing the garden through the scripture is the garden is such a large theme. You know, if you find certain themes in scripture, certain themes are like keys that begin to unlock every book of the Bible. So if you have this key of the garden, then when you approach the the book of Judges, now where do I see God wanting to dwell with his people in his garden? When I approach the book of, I don't know, Leviticus. I love Leviticus, but most people do not enjoy Leviticus. 
How do I take the key of the garden and begin to unlock Leviticus? How do I take the key of the garden and unlock the book of Romans? I am going to see, because Holy Spirit's a good author, I'm going to see this theme from beginning to end. So use it like a key. And this is just one example. These images, uh, trees, land, rivers, fruit, use them like keys because you're going to see them throughout all of your Bible. And it's pointing to the desire of God's heart. I want you all to say it with me. To dwell with his people in his garden. Can you all say that? To dwell with his people in his garden. That's our takeaway tonight. This is what Abba wants. He wants to dwell with you in his garden. So let's look now at the fall, just quickly, as we're moving out of, out of Genesis at the fall. Genesis 3, 8 through 9, this is the fall, guys. This is the most heartbreaking moment within Scripture and where all of the conflict of the story is introduced. Adam and Eve has sinned, and they're about to lose everything. But guys, I want us to pay attention. We look at what Adam and Eve lost. But remember, if Abba's heart is to dwell in his garden with his people, look at what he has lost in this moment. It is heartbreaking. So Genesis 3, verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. There's a whole study right there. Cool of the day there means ruach. He was walking in the spirit. The spirit of God is moving through the garden like he has every day that they've lived in it. He's walking in the garden like they he has every day that they've lived in it. But this time they hear him. And this is a response. It says, Adam and his wife hid themselves when they heard him from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So typically, they hear the spirit of the Lord moving in the garden. They run to him, and now they're running from him, and they're hiding themselves. In verse 9, it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And I love this phrase. We've talked about this. You're familiar with this. It's not like Abba didn't know where they were, right? This is a, a big question. Where are you? Meaning you are so far removed from the goodness that I created. It's essentially, what have you done, son? What's happened? Where are you? So he said, Adam, I heard your voice. Think about that. I heard your voice in the garden. Ooh. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Guys, think about how many people, this is where they live. They hear the invitation of the Lord. They hear other people talk about the Lord and they hide themselves naked and afraid. He, he evokes fear when really we're meant to run to him. There's this invitation when he's walking, we're running. It, it used to be Adam heard him moving and he's like, ah, oh, Abba's here. Daddy showed up. Let's go commune with him. And now he's running. I want you to think about your life and moments where you've run or removed yourself from the invitation to come. We get busy. We'll remove ourselves with all kinds of things. And a lot of those things, it's essentially out of fear. Why do we submit to all the distractions around us? Man, there's so many reasons, but at the heart of it, it's fear. Whatever it is we're allowing to distract us in our lives, is the fear is the basic motivation. If I'm distracted by I got to work all this out. Why? Because the fear is if I don't do it, nobody else will. I got to fix my finances. Why? If I don't do it, nobody else will. Though my finances will fall apart. We won't have enough. I've got to get on social media or be doing busy, 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 busy all the time. Why? Because I'm afraid if I stop for a minute, I'll just fall apart. I'll implode. All of these distractions, all of this naked and afraid, fear, fear is the basis of why we hear the voice of the Lord in the cool of the day and mankind runs from it when we were created to run to it. We were created to run to it. So something's going to have to be fixed. Something has been irrevocably broken because now Adam runs from what he used to run to. So he hides himself. This is the most heartbreaking it's just, is everybody's heart just broken right now? <laughs> okay. No, this is the most heartbreaking scripture in the Bible. 
I don't want to make light of it. This is a big deal. And so in this moment, Abba's dream of living with his people in his garden disintegrates. This paradise he's created, the intent of his heart, it's gone. It was lost in a moment where man chose his way over Abba's. And we could look at all of that and all the parts of the decision that was made and the enemy that was there. There's so much there. But at the basis, I want you to see that Abba lost his dream. So now as we move through the Pentateuch, we move through these five books of the Bible. We're not going to go through each one, but I want us to look at Exodus. In Exodus 25 specifically, we meet Moses. Now Moses is, is a friend of God. And on Mount Sinai, God gives Moses some instructions. He gives him instructions for creating a tabernacle. This is a garden tabernacle. God is saying, we've lost this. But as, as readers, and even as the children of Israel, we're, we're supposed to pick up on what Holy Spirit's trying to show us. And that Abba still wants the same thing. So now he's come to Moses and he wants to show his chosen people, I still want the same thing. So he gives Moses this instruction, I want you to create this garden tabernacle so that I can meet with you in this place. And I call it a garden tabernacle because the tabernacle's construction, its design was to evoke a garden. Throughout the entire tabernacle is garden imagery, and that's not by accident. It's the Father's heart coming through. Again, I want to dwell with my people. Y'all say it with me. I want to dwell with my people in my garden. And so he gives them the instruction for the tabernacle. Now, there's two little details I want us to look at. There's so many, but let's just hit two. In Exodus 25, um, 31 through 40, I just gave you all the reference. I just gave you the reference. We don't have to to pull it all up because it's a lot of uh, verses. But this reference here in Exodus 25 describes just one detail, one detail from the tabernacle, and it's the menorah. In the midst of the tabernacle is standing this, this huge candelabra, this menorah. Now, the menorah is modeled after a tree. It's designed, I think we have an image of it, it's designed to look like a tree, an almond tree. And each one of those joints is actually blossoms, almond blossoms. And it's inlaid with gold. And the oil within this lamp is to be tended to continually so it can continually burn. So in the midst of this garden tabernacle, we see a tree standing that has this eternal quality to it. It's always bearing fruit because it's made of gold. It's eternal because it's gold, meaning this is, this is built to last. And then it's always burning. It's supposed to point to this eternal quality. So what we see here in this tabernacle through this tree, it's to give us this aha moment of, ah, I see what Abba is doing. We're in the garden with the tree of life. This tree of life is present in this tabernacle, this garden tabernacle. And I love this. There's a lot to do with almond branches and the priesthood that I wish we could look at. Um, but I don't know if we can. Is that my time? Good Lord. Y'all, we don't have to blaze. Let's go. Okay, so the next part, uh, just Exodus 28, 33. I love this detail in the Old Testament. And we're, we're still right in the priesthood. Exodus 28, 33. We see a description of the high priest's robes. And I love this, guys. And the high priest's robes, across the hem of his robes, they have created out of thread little pomegranates. There's little pomegranates hanging all around the high priest's robes. It's pomegranates and bells. Pomegranate and bell. And so when the high priest moved, it made a noise. And it says it made a sound so the high priest wouldn't die. And I've heard all kinds of input on this that the people need to be able to hear the high priest, but also it's a sound signifying to Abba that the high priest is moving in the temple. And it's signifying, I'm here, here I am, Lord, <laughs> don't kill me. Because you know, in the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament, God's presence was dangerous. Do you know that? Because we hadn't been atoned for. The cross hadn't happened for, but yet. So being in the manifest presence of God is dangerous. So he's walking around jingling, and he's got pomegranates on his robe. Is there an image of that? It's pomegranates. So what I love about this, we have a high priest, 
a representation, an image bearer of God who's put in this garden tabernacle and he is literally bearing fruit. This representative is literally bearing fruit. He's holding fruit. He's carrying it on his robes. So what I want you to see here is there's beginning in the Old Testament to be this blur between the garden and man. He's starting to introduce us to this concept that the garden may not just be a location on the map. Maybe it's a man. It's a person. He's marrying the image of garden and the image of man, Imago Dei, the person. So let us look at this. Oh, just quickly, if we think back to the fall, if we think back to the fall where, where Adam hides himself, you know, they, they put together fig leaves to cover themselves. They put together leaves, so they're wearing parts of a tree. You see how that's this, this image of man and the tree and man and bearing fruit. They're putting leaves on themselves. And I love that, to me, that's such a picture of religion is I'm going to manufacture being like a tree. <laughs> but really, we're just hiding ourselves from Abba. And the Lord's like, no, that's not how we're going to do it. <laughs> You're all going to have to leave so I can work this new plan. Because you are going to bear fruit, but it's not going to be manufactured. It's going to be real, and it's going to come by the Spirit of the Lord and through this person. So now, guys, we're going to have to blaze the history. When you look through the histories, this is Judges, Ruth, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Esther. There's all of this image. Just take the book of Esther, for example. That entire story plays out over and over in gardens. If you'll notice, the whole story is playing out in gardens. It opens up King Xerxes is hosting a feast in his garden pavilion. So you see the imagery of the garden over and over. And that's the history. Just thinking about the land, the promised land. The purpose of giving them a land flowing was with milk and honey was so they could carry out the mandate to expand the garden. So that's the histories. Next in the Bible, we see the poetries or the wisdom literature. This is Proverbs, the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. This is the poetry. Now, poetry is all about metaphor. So all of the poetry books, the wisdom books, pick up this theme and runs with it. Picks up this theme and totally runs with it. You see imagery from this the trees, the land, the rivers, and the fruit, all throughout the poetry. But this is a specific shift I want to point our attention to in Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, we are introduced to a man described as delighting in the law. In the Old Testament, the Lord introduces the law and a high priest so that we can get back to the garden. He wants us to dwell with him. But in the Old Testament, we know that the law was broken over and over and over. But that's okay. That's why we have the high priest. That's why we have the Day of Atonement. But it wasn't just broken in the Old Testament. It was rejected, rejected over and over again through idolatry. Not only are we breaking your law, but we don't even want it. We don't want you. It's a rejection of Abba himself over and over. And so in Psalm 1, it talks about a man who doesn't reject the law. He delights in the law. And this is how it describes him. It says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. He is going to be like a tree. I read this. I loved this verse as a teen. I meditated on this verse, seeing myself in it. I wanted It gave me vision for my life. But in this moment, I want us just to see Christ. This prophetically speaking of a man who's going to be like a tree. And he's bearing fruit in every season. And he's planted by the rivers of living water. Holy Spirit. He's planted, immersed, saturated in Holy Spirit. So again, it's this idea in the Old Testament. The Lord is going to not just put us back in a garden. He's going to introduce a man that can bring the garden back to us. Does that make sense? He's introducing a man to us that can bring the garden back to us. And the prophets pick up on this. So I'll just give you for reference Jeremiah 17, 8. He quotes Psalm 1. We believe he's either paraphrasing. If he's not paraphrasing Psalm 1, then that means Holy Spirit gave him the same word again because it's almost word for word Psalm 1. Then in Isaiah 4, 2, 
Isaiah brings fresh layers. It says in Isaiah 4.2, In the day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. Isaiah 11.10 takes this further. Now remember, we're realizing that there's a man who's reintroducing this garden. Isaiah says it plainly, 11 verse 10. He says, in the day there shall be a root of Jesse, a root of Jesse. So this is a descendant of Jesse who we're going to call a root. He's a root who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. So from this root, what we're to gather, there's going to be a person like a tree who is the root of Jesse. And from this root, Abba is going to regrow his garden. He is going to recreate his garden. And that brings us all the way through the prophets. Now, after all of the prophets, the major and the minor prophets, between the prophets and the New Testament, the Gospels, there's 400 years of silence. 400 years of silence. Now, this is an Antonetism. I want y'all to know as we, as I share this with you, this is just the way I think of that space between the prophets and the Gospels, where we are introduced to the root of Jesse in Christ Jesus. That 400 years I think of as when in the beginning in, in Genesis 1, the Holy Spirit, it says that the earth was formless and void. And the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, that's like the space, you know, that's 400 years, guys, for generations. The Lord has been preserving this root. He's been preserving this seed, this, this royal bloodline to bring in the King of Kings, the root of Jesse. And after these 400 years of silence, we are going to be introduced to the living word who is the root himself, Christ Jesus. And guys, that is what we're going to pick up on next week is we're going to look, we're going to find the root of Jesse and see what he carries us through throughout the gospels in showing us the heart of God to dwell with his people in his garden. Then we're going to move through the, the letters, all of the epistles, and then end up back in Revelation 22. Does that sound okay? I hope this blessed you guys. I hope it's fun. This is a fun study.